Welcome everyone. I am so happy to have you here. For anyone who's watching the video, if you see me looking down, I'm looking at my phone because I am actually on Clubhouse and I'm talking to a room full of people inside Clubhouse. And it helps me to look at each of you who are here in Clubhouse and feel like there's people actually listening as I speak rather than just looking at myself on the video. So this is a topic that has been front and front of mind for me, honestly, probably for decades, ever since I was, a, you know, a teenager and decided that I needed to fix myself, that there was something wrong with me that that needed to improve. And, and it's funny, because I've learned that the more I accept myself as I am, the easier it is to, to level up as a human to step into new ways of being that are more resourceful. And since becoming a hypnotist, I've been a hypnotist for about five years now. And I'm always looking for ways, you know, looking for the underlying agent of change. When people change, what is it that generates that change? And my goal today is really just in a few minutes, I don't expect this to take a really long time to help you understand how you can go from where you are to where you want to be in any area of your life. This works any place where you behave in a way that you don't that you don't want to behave anymore. So you could apply this to addictive behaviors like um, overeating, over drinking, using any substance more than you would like, to any kind of compulsive behavior like overspending or um, procrastinating worrying. <laughs> if a person struggles with anxiety or depression or anger or any habits in the way that we act and the way that we show up in the world, this is kind of controversial for me to say, but my experience shows and the reason that I love hypnosis so much is that there are ways to step out of those behaviors. There are ways to step out of anxiety, to step out of depression. And I'm going to, I'm going to touch on the depression one for a moment, because that's, I, I get a lot of flack sometimes when I talk about um, helping people step out of depression. The reason I decided to become a hypnotherapist, and I don't actually call myself a hypnotherapist to so just cancel that suggestion. I'm not allowed to call myself that in Colorado. The reason I decided to become a hypnotist is because I learned hypnosis to help myself with weight issues. And the unexpected side effect that I wasn't even going for is that it showed me how to step out of decades of severe clinical depression that I had been diagnosed with multiple times. So I do believe that we have the ability to step out of these things. And today is a really good day for me to be doing this video because it is March 16th. I woke up this morning. Yesterday was like a beautiful spring-like day. I went for a walk with a t-shirt on and it was beautiful weather. And I woke up today and it's kind of gloomy and cloudy and it's supposed to rain later and it might snow in a couple days. And my body, like I just woke up feeling depressed. There are some tr hard things going on in my life as there, as there often are in everyone's life, but nothing unusually hard but I just woke up feeling like, eh, and, and like, I don't want to work. I don't want to smile. I, I just went up downstairs and did a workout a few minutes ago, just to like get myself going. And I wanted to be super candid about that because I believe by sharing that with you, it helps you see that I, that I understand how you feel <laughs> if you struggle with depression. I believe, and I don't know if this is true, um, but I suspect, and my observation has shown me that that anxiety and depression, and these are underneath so many of the things that people struggle with, are kind of like opposite sides of the same coin. So before I, to um, lay the foundation for this conversation, I want to tell you that I, I this this room is about how to stop letting habits control you in three easy steps. So I'm operating on the belief, this is my belief, it may or may not be true, and it may or may not match your belief, but I'm operating on the belief that depression is a habit, a habitual way of being. It's a way of showing up in the world. Anxiety is a habitual way of being. People have gotten so used to showing up in the world in this way that it has become a habit. And so when a person is anxious or depressed or a chronic procrastinator or struggles with anger, they are actually doing something with their physiology 
that is keeping them stuck. And I, and I don't mean this in a blame way, like um, it's their fault. Uh, please know that I do not mean that. <laughs> but there's something happening in the body that is generating that behavior. And with depression, I talk about this often in the context of three Bs. Um, the, that's the letter B as in boy. And when a person is experiencing anxiety, they're doing something with the first B, body language, the second B, breathing, and the third B, belief. And all beliefs are is, is the thing that we're saying to ourselves. It's our recycled self-talk. We think that beliefs are really sticky and they can't be changed, but they can be changed really, really easily if you change your physiology in the form of your body language and your breathing first. So when a person is anxious, depressed, procrastinating, angry, they're doing something with their three Bs. Their three Bs are the activity that, that supports that feeling, that emotion. I fully acknowledge that there are chemical, chemical changes happening in the body. You know, when a person struggles chronically with anxiety, they, they have an influx of, um, Oh my gosh, now I can't even think of any of the chemicals. <laughs> Adrenaline, <laughs> cortisol, different stress chemicals are present in the body. And it is scientifically proven that there's a breathing pattern that can actually offload those stress chemicals from the body and put them into a place of, of peace and of rest and of stasis. And I know that many of you have heard me talk about this before. It's called the physiological sigh. And I learned this from Dr. Andrew Huberman. And it happens when a person takes a deep inhale through the nose. So you breathe fully in. And if you can breathe from your belly and with your mouth closed and take a deep inhale and then another little sip of air through the, through the nose so that you're breathe, filling your lungs a little more full and then letting it out with a long sigh of relief out the mouth. So it sounds like this. Hopefully that comes across like clubhouse. Okay. I always wonder how these breathing things work, but try this with me now. Just take a deep inhale in through your nose, sip a little bit more air and let it out with a sigh of relief through the mouth. And you want to make sure that that exhale is longer than the inhale. Because here's what I've observed is people who struggle with anxiety tend to put an emphasis on the inhale they inhale more strongly than they exhale. They tend to inhale high in the chest and it tends to be a fairly rapid breathing pattern. And the opposite is true with depression. When people struggle with depression, there's more of an emphasis on the exhale. It's almost like you'll hear people who, who are depressed sigh often. I, I am a sigher myself when I notice myself feeling depressed. And it's interesting because um, I, I actually haven't even thought about this this morning until just now that I could start to change my breathing to step out of, like, I just felt like I want to cry all morning, you guys. <laughs> um, and when a person um, is depressed, they're, de they're generally, it's like um, a downward, they're looking down, their countenance is downward facing, their body language is down. Um, the corners of their mouth are often turned down. If I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror, when I'm feeling down, I notice that I'm like pouting almost, and I don't even realize I'm doing it. When a person experiences anxiety, there's more tension in the body. Like a lot of times they're, they're holding tension in the shoulders or the neck or, or their fists are clenched or their jaw is clenched. And one of the craziest things about helping people with anxiety or depression is we can let them start to shift their three Bs, their body language, their breathing, and their belief, which is what they're saying to themselves in the moment. And it lets them step right out of that. So to put this all in the context of this room, how to stop letting habits control you in three easy steps. Step one is when you're noticing yourself feeling stuck. And this could be, you know, if, if you're a person who struggles with anxiety, depression, procrastinating, um, anger, overeating, over drinking, using any kind of substance in a way that you don't want to, overspending. The num step one is to ask yourself, what do I want to experience instead? What is the goal? 
And one of the most useful ways to ask this, and this is how I would ask people when I used to do one-on-one -on -one sessions, which I don't do anymore, so don't ask me. <laughs> I would say, okay, and I'm going to do this on video so people who are watching this video can see the visual representation of this. When that anxiety is a thing of the past, what do you want to have in its place? And so for those who are on Clubhouse, I'm visually holding anxiety in front of me like it's a ball. And then when I say when it's a thing of the past, I'm pushing it into the past. On video, it might look like I'm pushing it into the future because this is flipped around. <laughs> And then I come back and I hold an empty space in front of me and say, what do you want to have there in its place? And the reason this is such a useful question is because oftentimes when you, when someone comes in and they say, oh, I'm really struggling with anxiety or I'm really struggling with depression, we're trained as hypnotists to say, well, what do you want instead? And they will so often say, well, I, I don't want to be anxious anymore. I don't want to worry about my kids. I don't want to freak out when I, when I merge into traffic on the highway or I don't like if you ask someone who struggles with their weight, I don't want to keep overeating. I don't want to keep mindless snacking. I don't want to keep binging. I don't want to emotionally eat. And what this does is every time we talk about what we don't want, we are literally creating a picture for the unconscious mind of the exact thing we don't want. And the unconscious mind doesn't hear, it doesn't register don't. It just sees the picture that we're creating with our words and drives us toward it. So when we're thinking, I don't want to feel depressed, oh my gosh, if I could just stop feeling so depressed, we are literally programming ourselves to continue feeling depressed. So when you ask that question, when that depression is a thing of the past, what do you want to experience instead? It starts to shift them. You'll, you'll often notice them, them starting to look around with their eyes as if they're looking for the answer and they're thinking, huh. I never thought about that before. And this is actually the moment of, of opportunity because this is where they start to think about the problem in a new light. So question one is asking, what do I want to experience instead? So instead of anxiety, a person might want to experience peace. Instead of, I just realized I might have lipstick on my teeth. Okay, I, I don't. <laughs> instead of depression, a person might want to feel optimistic or even just to feel okay. And here's where I want to um, create another side note. And this is, I listened to a podcast recently. It's funny because when I think about the podcast, I can remember where I was. And I was actually on a, on a hike in Hawaii. Let me see if I can get my camera to focus. Sorry, Clubhouse people. I'm preoccupied <laughs> with, with what's going on in the video. I was hiking in Hawaii, listening to this podcast, and, and I can, it's like I can still smell the, the fresh um, earth around me. I can still feel the crunch of, of leaves underneath my feet. And the woman was talking about the neuroscience um, between how our brain regulates emotions. And often when a person is wanting to be free of depression, like, like I, you know, this was my goal for so many decades, I thought that the opposite, the antidote to depression, <laughs> excuse me, now I've sneezed on the video. <laughs> I thought that the antidote was to depression was feeling like this exhilarating high, like as low as I felt depressed was as high as I wanted to feel okay. And I learned in this podcast that our brain actually, it craves just um, a flatness for lack of a better word. So the woman who explained this, who is a neuroscientist, she explained it as a teeter-totter. And when we're feeling really down, it's like these sad gremlins are jumping on the teeter-totter and they're, they're just holding it down and making it feel awful. And then when we feel really high, it's like we, we put this happy, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but it's like this happy monster on the teeter-totter and it goes up the other way. And the sad gremlins are going to come jump on it again to try to get it to level out. Our brain craves a level teeter-totter. And so as we start to look to the antidote for anxiety or depression or anger or any of these, these habitual ways of showing up in the world, I recommend that one of the most useful, the most useful goals is to just be able to just be like, stop being controlled by needing something to happen in the external environment for you to be okay. That okayness, like, 
okay is actually a really desirable state. <laughs> And the first time this was presented to me, I was at a training in Florida with Michael Watson called Core Transformation. It's a protocol developed by Connie Ray Andreas. And one of the desires, the, the desired outcome of Core Transformation is to help the part of you that is generating anxiety or depression or mindless eating or substance abuse or whatever the thing is that you are doing to help yourself feel okay that by healing those parts of us and by letting those parts of us realize it's okay not to engage in those behaviors, the ultimate goal is actually okayness. And I really resisted that. I didn't want to believe that. I'm like, no, I want to feel high all the time. I just want to feel optimistic and happy and go, 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 go. And when I experienced the protocol, you guys, oh my gosh, it was so amazing because I got to this core state that I labeled bliss and I'm so grateful because five years later, I, I can still remember that experience and continue to move back toward it. I don't know. I don't often re-experience that deep state of bliss as I did in that moment, but it felt like an isness, like, yes, the world is a hurricane all around me, but I am in the eye of the storm and I am okay in this moment. And when we start to utilize that, as we look for the antidote to the thing that ails us, it's a beautiful place to be. Okay, so again, <laughs> question one, how do I, what do I want to experience instead? And my suggestion is that it's just an, the experience of being okay, because when we feel okay, we don't have to experience anxiety or depression, or we don't need to reach for extra food or extra, any other extra substance to make ourselves feel better. And so question two is, step two is ask yourself, how would somebody who has this thing that I want act? So it could be, how would a naturally thin person who doesn't struggle with their weight act? How would a person who, who doesn't struggle with anger, who's just calm, cool, and collected and doesn't let people get under their skin, how would that person act? Um, how would a person who feels optimistic and okay with life act? And this is where then the three B's come in because step three is to act accordingly by adjusting your three B's and to start to create a habit of being. So many times when a person struggles with anxiety or depression or, or even overeating or procrastinating, we've learned that habit somewhere. I know for me, I think it was ingrained in me as a very small child witnessing my mom with some depressive attributes. And I think my dad might've had some as well. And so witnessing other people is how we learn how to show up in the world. We see someone else doing it and then we take it on as our own behavior. And then we repeat it over and over and over. And again, this is not me saying that there aren't legitimate chemical um, things happening when a person struggles with some of these things. However, even in those instances, I believe that the things I'm, I'm talking about can help dramatically. I really do. So <laughs> um, when, when we decide somebody who is good at this, and then we take on their three Bs, we just imagine the way that, that they would look when they're doing the thing that we want to do. How are they holding their body language? What, you know, if a person is anxious and they think about someone who is, who is just naturally calm, and they just simply imagine that person being in the room with them and look at that person. And this works even if you're not a visual person, because you can pick this up. Um, you can kind of get a feel for it, even if you're not seeing it. And you notice, okay, well, their shoulders are relaxed, they're down, they're back, they're breathing from the low in the belly, their breathing is relaxed and subtle, they're exhaling for longer than they're inhaling. And then when you ask what, like, if there was a thought bubble coming out of their head, and you could see their thoughts, what is this person thinking? And sometimes you'll get resistance because they'll say, I don't know. And that's okay, because if you make it up and if you guess, it actually works just as well, especially if you go with the first thing that comes to you, the unconscious mind, which is that highest self part of you that knows the things you don't realize, you know, that part of you wants to answer first. So that knee jerk reaction, the first thing that comes to mind when you think, well, what would a, what would a calm, peaceful person feel or think in this moment? What's going through their mind? 
Because when a person is experiencing anxiety, they're often thinking, what if this bad thing happens? I can't do this. Oh my gosh, this is too much. And two things cannot occupy the same place at the same time. So when you start to insert a new belief and say, I am okay, I am here, all is well, it, it literally pushes out those other thoughts and allows you to, to experience peace. If you've ever tried affirmations like that, um, Louise Hay has some of my favorite affirmations, and I shared this on the last Clubhouse as well. If you can't think what that third B should be, that belief, I invite you to try this one on. It's, and so again, I learned this from Louise Hay, and it's just all is well. Everything is working out for my highest good. Out of this situation, only good will come. And I am safe. And I know it can be really hard to believe that when, when there is a hurricane going on around you. I had mentioned earlier on this call that I'm, having, I'm experiencing some hard stuff in my life right now. And it can be hard to, to believe that when we say it. But I believe it can be just as easy with repetition. And especially if you adjust your first two Bs first, you adjust your body language and breathing that it can be just as easy to believe that everything is going to be okay as it is to believe that everything is going to end in an absolute disaster. And often, no matter how intense life is right now, going on all around you in this moment, you can experience bliss. So again, step one is to ask, what do I want to experience instead? Step two is how would somebody who's good at this act? How would they behave? What are the behaviors that you could plug in? And then step three is to act accordingly by adjusting your three Bs to create a habit of being. Because what happens is every time you change your behavior, every time you shift your three Bs and start to act in a new way, and this is a really good way to overcome the I don't feel like it. Like if you're wanting to reach for a bag of chips because you're, you're bored and you're, or you're stressed out and your habit is to reach for a bag of chips. And it's like, I don't, I want the bag of chips. If you adjust your three B's into a more resourceful way and you tell yourself, I am content, it makes it much easier to insert, to change your behavior in that moment without having to use willpower because willpower really is actually scientifically shown to be a losing strategy. <laughs> Um, okay. As you repeat the behavior that allows you to, to become the person you want to become, every time you repeat that behavior, it's like casting a vote for, for the identity that you want to step into. Because if a person has struggled with anxiety and they say, I am an anxious person, or I am a depressed person, or I am so angry, you're actually putting that on like a label. You're giving it to yourself as an identity. And when you repeatedly step out of that behavior over and over and over again, it allows you to put on a new identity that says, I am calm. I am okay. Man, that's a good one, you guys. I am okay. What if that was our identity? I am okay. It's going to feel really weird at first. It's going to feel uncomfortable. And one of the things I love so much about the fact that I, I'm not feeling, I wasn't feeling super okay when I woke up this morning, like I was, I was practicing that depression habit that was, became so ingrained in me in the first 40 years of my life. When you experience that old behavior again, whether it's an addictive tendency or an angry tendency or an anxious tendency, it doesn't mean it didn't work. It doesn't mean that you're broken. It doesn't mean that you are hopeless. It simply means that you are, you are utilizing the part of you that knows how to be anxious. It simply means that you are literally doing something with your three Bs and you can step out of it as simply as it takes seconds to shift your three Bs. And I'll walk you through this in a moment. So I keep putting my foot up on a prop in front of me. And every time I put my foot up, I lose my train of thought. So I'm going to put my three Bs back where they were and, and get back in the zone here. Um, I want to call your attention to the fact that it's going to feel weird to do this. It's not going to happen overnight. You're going to have to change your behavior over and over and over again before it becomes a habit. 
So I have two things, two gifts that I want to give you. And the first one is the gift of opposite brushing. And I have shared this many times and it's such a powerful tool because it trains your unconscious mind and your conscious mind to recognize the discomfort of changing your behavior, whether it's starting to worry about your kids and realizing, oh yeah, it doesn't serve me to be anxious and worry about my kids and and step out of that anxiety by shifting your three B's or whether it's stop stopping mindless snacking, whatever that behavior is, it's going to feel uncomfortable and you're not going to want to. <laughs> so right now, I invite you to start brushing your teeth with the opposite hand, what, whichever hand you usually brush your teeth with. I want you to start brushing your teeth with the opposite hand. And what this is going to do is it's going to feel really uncomfortable. It's going to make you want to cuss at me because you hate it. (laughs) And it's going to teach you, I can do uncomfortable things and be okay. I don't have to feel like it to change my behavior. So if, if you are willing to play this game, I invite you right now just to vividly imagine that you are in the place where you are when you brush your teeth. Imagine you're there right now, seeing what you see, hearing what you hear, feeling what you feel, maybe smelling what you smell. And by doing this, by vividly imagining that you're getting ready to brush your teeth right now, you're actually hypnotizing yourself to remember. This is what a great self-hypnotist you are. And now I want you to imagine that you can see your hand reaching for your toothbrush. You're just about to get put your toothbrush in your hand and you remember, oh yeah, I'm an opposite brush. So you switch hands and you pick the toothbrush up with that opposite hand. And then you pick your toothpaste up with the, with the opposite hand. Then you usually hold your toothpaste and you squirt it on the toothbrush and you start to brush your teeth with that hand. And you are going to notice that your, like your shoulder is moving in weird ways. Your elbow is moving in weird ways. Toothpaste drool is dripping down your mouth. And you can, what I want you to do is I want you to tell yourself uncomfortable things become automatic uncomfortable things can become automatic. And this is your toothbrushing mantra. I want you to repeat this as you brush your teeth and it's gonna become ingrained in your psyche in a way that helps you remember when you're feeling anxious and you don't feel like stepping out of it, that you can do it anyway. And as you do it over and over and over, you actually change your automatic tendency of how you show up in the world and you train yourself to become calm because the brain loves to automate our activities. It loves to automate depression and anxiety. And when we teach it over and over again, okay, now we're gonna experience this instead, it starts to memorize that and it starts to make it automatic. And before you know it, you don't have to try anymore. You just show up in the world as okay. And when you're okay, you don't struggle with anger. You don't struggle with anxiety and depression. I mean, you're going to struggle sometimes. We're humans, right? You're never going to arrive at perfection. But people don't struggle with wanting to mindlessly snack or wanting to binge eat when they are feeling that okayness. Okay. (laughs) I hope this has been helpful. So that's the first first gift that I want to give you is the gift of opposite brushing along with the mantra. And if you repeat that mantra the whole time you're brushing your teeth, it's going, you're going to hypnotize yourself for okayness so much more quickly. And then the second tool I want to give you is just the experience of okayness right now, the experience of a level teeter totter. So you can start to understand what it feels like to step out of depression, to step out of anxiety, anger, to step out of the urge to use a substance in a way that is not beneficial for your body, to step out of the need to overspend, whatever that habit is that you want to break. I believe this is the antidote. And the more you practice this, the better you'll get at it. And the better you get at it, the more that you'll start to change on an identity level and start to just see yourself as okay, no matter what is going on around you. And it's really simple. (laughs) But if you're able to just take about 30 seconds, let's say 60 seconds, um, to just experience a little piece of bliss in your day, then I invite you just to take a deep breath from low in the belly and let it out with a long slow sigh of relief. 
And if your eyes are closed, I'd actually like you to open your eyes and I'd like you to look at a spot that's in front of you and a little bit above your line of vision, just something perhaps across the room, wherever you are, just find one spot to focus on intently and intensely, almost like you're zoning out. And it's almost like you're looking right through that spot and your, your vision is starting to soften as you continue to gaze in that direction. And just begin to become aware of the space around that spot. And as you become aware of that space, I want you just simply to notice and name in your mind three objects that you're aware of in your peripheral vision. Just simply name those objects in your mind. Good. And as you continue to focus on that spot, aware of the space between you and that spot, aware of the space around your body. I'd like you just to notice and name in your mind three sounds you can hear, and I'll be quiet while you do that. Perhaps noticing sounds you didn't, you didn't notice before. And as you continue to bask in this moment, to focus your eyes on that spot, to notice the space in this room, I invite you just to notice three things you can feel, like the feeling of your clothing against your skin, the feeling of your body resting on the surface beneath you. Notice the sensation of your tongue inside your mouth and let that noticing allow your teeth to slightly separate and your tongue to relax on the floor of your mouth. As you think to yourself, I am here. And I am okay in this moment. And I think that was probably way longer than 60 seconds. <laughs> but the amazing thing is that you can do this anytime, anywhere. I have been walking through the grocery store and feeling stressed out about something and just started to name the name three things. I call it the three by three. You name three things you can see, three things you can hear, and three things you can feel. And that brings you into right now. Because when a person is struggling with these different habitual behaviors, they are living in the future or they're living in the past. Anxiety is often a, a future problem and depression is often a past problem. And when you come into right now, there is so much peace in the right now. There is so much peace in this present moment. And I just want to talk for a moment before I close and say it can be really scary to let go of habitual ways of showing up in the world. It can be really scary to let go of anxiety or worry or procrastination or depression or chronic sadness because it feels comfortable. It feels familiar. And there's a part of us, even though it's, it's a nonverbal prehistoric part of our brain that thinks that it's keeping us safe because familiar equals safety. And it might suck. Like you might hate feeling this way, but it feels comfortable. <laughs> and I want you to know that it, we change best by feeling good, that it is safe to feel good, that when you are feeling anxious, you have, are literally taking your resources offline that would allow you to problem creatively solve this problem. When you are feeling depressed, you are unable to creatively solve the problem. BJ Fogg says, we change best by feeling good. And when we allow ourselves to go in and feel good over and over and over, just to feel, just to experience okayness, to experience that level teeter totter, it allows us to change on an identity level. And it allows us to find creative resources that we might've missed before that can actually help us either solve the problem or deal with the problem in a more resourceful way. I hope this is helpful. Thank you so much for being here today, you guys. This, this has been a really hard topic for me to teach. <clears throat> and by, by teaching it, even though I feel uncomfortable with it and don't feel 
totally ready. It's giving me clarity. So I'm really happy. I remember to record this room. If you come back to my, um, I think the best way to find my replays is just to come to my profile and all my past rooms will be here. And if you're watching this video on YouTube or Facebook or anywhere else, I might choose to put this video. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you found massive value. If you're able to comment wherever you're watching, I would love it if you do so. I see a couple of comments here in Clubhouse. I'm going to just look. Um, okay, that's a Clubhouse related question, so I'm not going to um, address it, but Thank you so much to everyone who is here today. I appreciate you. Let me know what you want future uh, clubhouse rooms or videos about. If you email me, and this is something different than I've said in the past, email me at Lori, L-O-R-I, at trancypants.com, T-R-A-N-C-Y-P-A-N-T-S. I will do a room for you in the future, do one of these topics for you in the future. Have a beautiful day, everyone. And now I'm saying goodbye for real on this video because I don't want to go edit the end off, but I just turned off Clubhouse and now I'm going to turn off my video. Have a beautiful day. Thank you so much for watching with me.